Welcome to Faith with Flavor, the place to be to season and encourage your faith. I'm your host, Donna Clayton. Dating can be a complicated thing to say the least, especially in this day and age when everything seems to be documented on social media, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But there is a way of dating God's way that can save you a lot of headaches and trouble. Today you will meet an author and certified relationship expert who specializes in teaching people the spiritual principles they should live by before saying I do. But first, another spiritual principle is the fact that faith without works is dead. Watch as I unfold this principle at my latest speaking engagement. So one day, I get a call and it's from the head production manager at TBN. And whenever this guy calls you, it's a big deal. So I was like, okay, brace yourself, Donna. <laughs> and I walk in and he proceeds to tell me, well, Donna, you know, we're opening up this new network. It's gonna reach the Hispanic American community and we want you to run it. <laughs> and I had to do like one of those double takes, like, are you talking to me? <laughs> and he surely was. And you know, my first job assignment was to look for content for the network. And in that moment, it was like God, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. He said, this is what you've been praying for. And remember that dream? Go for it. And then I'm thinking, but God, what do you mean go for it? <laughs> what does that mean? And he just said, go for it. Now in that moment, I had two choices. I could sit back and not do anything and regret it for the rest of my life, or I could put action to my faith. Because how many of you know that faith without works is dead? Now I don't wanna have that. So I went ahead and I wrote up a proposal as best as I knew. And I'd never written a proposal in my life, but I put something together. And that proposal is what some of you may know now as Faith with Flavor, my Christian talk show where I get to brag about the Lord. If you just started tuning into the show, that was a look at my latest speaking engagement where I talk about being faithful with the little God has given you. If you would like to book me for a speaking engagement at your local church, please find me at lifewithdonna.com and fill out a contact form to get in touch with me. And now without further ado, let's meet today's guest, certified relationship specialist and author, Nadia Heron. Nadia, Hi, welcome Donna. to Faith with Flavor. Thank you so much for having me. It's such Thank an honor to have you. You know, as soon as I met you, I was like, this girl, she's got a bubbly personality. She's an author, relationship expert. I have to have her on Faith with Flavor. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Yes, and I am i can't wait to get into what we're going to talk about. But first, you know, maybe there's someone watching you for the very first time on television. So give us a little inside scoop into what it was like growing up for you. Well... I actually had a really challenging childhood. Um, I, I didn't have a father in the home, and so subsequently, not having the protection and covering of a father, I suffered uh, about 10 years of, of abuse during my childhood. Mm. And according to society standards, I was supposed to be destined to a life of, of drug abuse, suicide, and depression. And I had a choice. I could either listen to what the world says or I could believe what God said about me. And I chose the latter. That's beautiful. But you know what? It really takes somebody leading you and guiding you when you're young into the things of God because, you know, we don't, we don't know unless we're taught, right? Absolutely. So was there somebody in your life that really led you that, in that route? There was, I, m my mother was definitely a huge influence on me. We see our parents. And even though my mother raised us in church, um, it was just religion for me until we got into a really good Bible-based church and then I found relationship. Amen. And when did that happen? Because, you know, I know for me, it was when I was 19 years old that I really said yes to God and I surrendered my all to him. What, what was it for you? For me, it was at youth camp. I was 13 years old Aww. and I just, <laughs> you know, I just said, Lord, use me. I'm yours. And Amen. that was it for me. Now, I know when you're young, you know, it's such a process to really figure out like, what is it that God wants me to do? What's my purpose? I know me personally, I struggled with that. But what about you? Did you always know you wanted to be a relationship expert? 
I did not, but you know, I feel like the things that we're blessed in, it's our responsibility to leave a legacy of knowledge and information to other believers for the next generation, because if we don't, then the world will. And that's right. as believers, the ground is literally shifting beneath our feet. Donna, every 13 seconds, a couple gets divorced. So to put that wow. in perspective, by the time we finish this half hour broadcast, about 300 people are gonna be divorced. So you don't have to really look too far to see that the sacred covenant of marriage, which was meant for his glory, Amen. is being redefined for, with a lie. You don't have to look too far to see that there is a st strategic front there is a strategic plan by the enemy to dismantle the family unit on all fronts. So I just wanted to encourage uh, believers in marriage, and it all starts with relationships. What do you think separates, though, real quick, those that do make it from those that get a divorce? I think that those that do make it have a covenant perspective of marriage, and they honor God's design for marriage. And those that don't make it have a consumer view of marriage where they're kind of going Christmas shopping and if they don't like the gift, they can throw it away or exchange it. <laughs> right? It's like all about, am I, if I'm not happy, then this isn't meant to be. But when you said yes, I mean, when you said I do, that meant for life. That meant no matter if you have good days or bad days and sickness or in health, right? Right. For richer or for poorer, you got to stick it out. So we're going to teach them, right, how to do that. But we're also going to teach them how to date God's way because that's what your book is all about. You have a book out. Tell us about your book a little bit. Well, my book is about dating, and we cover um, so many things. We cover a big part of my book is addressing the dysfunction of our past. Um, we cover how to find a, a godly man, and we also cover insecurity because that's a big thing, and that's a big reason why we settle. I have a question for you. What is it that you get asked as a relationship expert? What do people come to you that are dating? What is the number one question that they ask you? The number one question that they ask me is like, how do I find a good guy? What do I look for in a husband? And I like to keep it simple, okay? The Word of God clearly says that he is to be a leader, a provider, and a protector, okay? And also a believer. That goes without saying, but right? for some people, you just have to remind them. Do not be unequally yoked, people. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So first, let's start with, is he a leader? Let's start with the relationship. Is he pursuing you in the relationship? Is he initiating the courtship? Or are you chasing him, you know, uh, proposing to yourself? I've seen some women propose to themselves on social media. Are, are you dragging <laughs> him down the aisle and then expecting him to be a leader in a godly marriage? Because that's just not going to work. So is he a leader? And is, is he someone that you're willing to be led by? Mm. Secondly, is he a provider? Can he take care of a family? Okay, because, and can I just say that being a janitor is a job, Amen. okay? So it's not very glamorous, glamorous, but it's very noble. So does, does he have a consistent job? Because if he can be assiduous, faithful, and diligent in that area of his life, then that's going to have transference to other areas of his life. So is he a provider? Exactly. And I think that's what God created them to be. They, he created them to be our provider, to be our protector, to be all the things you just mentioned. Absolutely. So what about, let's just say this guy has all those qualities and this girl is still not sure if he's the one, what do you say to her? I would say to just pray and continue to examine this man for godly characteristics and don't settle. Amen, don't settle, that's right. I read your book and one of the parts in your book that really I honestly loved because I think that we all carry some sort of baggage into a relationship and it's so important, it's so important for you to figure out who you are in Christ before you get into a relationship. And you address this so well in your book. Tell us about how you help people uncover that baggage and really be set free from it. Well, let's start with childhood. If anyone in your audience works in education, then you might know what ACEs are. ACEs are adverse childhood experiences. They can include trauma and neglect. And these things that we go through have a huge impact on our relationships. And as we grow, they have a huge impact on the more sophisticated neuroprocessing that we do later on in life. And so 
as Christian women, we're nurturers, and that's great. If our girlfriend, <laughs> you know, breaks up with the guy, we're like, girl, let's go yeah. stalk him on Facebook. If a family member gets sick, it's like, I'm gonna take care of you, and nurturing is great, yeah. but not when it comes to past hurt and past pain. We will have a bullet wound in our chest, and we'll be like, girl, you're bleeding, Are you, is everything okay? And we'll be like, no, girl, I'm fine, you know, that's nothing, <laughs> but we have to address the dysfunction of our past or the, the trauma that's happened to us because you'll find that the major collapses, the major breakdowns in our relationships stem from the unhealed places within ourselves. I agree 100%. I mean, you really have to be healthy within your, yourself in order to complement that mate that God has prepared for you. And I love that you talk about that in your book, but I want you to tell us three things that our audience can do right now to be healthy for their mate in the future. Well, number one, you definitely, as I said before, want to address the dysfunction of your past. That, that is huge. You don't want to take that baggage into the covenant of marriage. Number two, you want to surround yourself with godly marriages because we know that we're drawn to our environment and we will conform to what we're consistently exposed to. The statistics say that if two people from a divorced home get married, they're 200% more likely to get divorced. Mm. So if you're surrounding yourself with girlfriends who maybe have a negative viewpoint towards marriage, I'm not saying to cut them off, but you might want to rethink the amount of time that you spend with them mm -hmm. and surround yourself with godly counsel. Like-minded people, right? Yes. Now, some of us are born into an environment of dysfunction. Some of us have some dysfunctional families. We cannot help that, but we can help not letting our environment get inside of us. I think we all have a little bit of dysfunction if you really look, <laughs> right? Absolutely. That's why we needed a savior because we couldn't save ourselves. Yes. And and the final thing that I, I can't leave out is that the most powerful thing that we can do in preparing for a godly marriage is prayer. Amen. The, the spouse that God is preparing for you needs your prayer right now at this moment and also pray for wisdom and discernment and the courage to act and not ignore red flags. So prayer is definitely one of the most powerful things we can do. I love that because, you know, there's the saying that is all over the world and, and it says that love is blind, right? And if you don't, if you just ignore those red flags, you could really get into some deep trouble. Absolutely. But you also talk about listening to that inner voice you know, that still small voice that is constantly speaking to us and telling us which way to go. How, do, how can we do that? Well, if I could see the audience, I would ask them to raise their hand if you ever had a time in your life where you were going somewhere and you felt like maybe I shouldn't go or somebody new was coming into your life and you knew that there was something about them, but you couldn't quite put your finger on it. So scientifically speaking, our inner voice is just a powerful catalog of information that we collect throughout our lives. Now, as believers, we have the Holy Spirit, Amen. which is innate, lifelong guidance source directly from God. Okay. I would like to share a story of a time where this guy wanted to date me okay. and he was very persistent, very aggressive, and I knew him very well. And he was, you know, not bad looking either. <laughs> He was cute, right? Temptation. <laughs> yes. So there's no reason that I had, no good reason that I had not to go out with him except for this quiet inner voice, this feeling saying, don't do it. So I didn't. And then mm. fast forward two years later, this guy is serving life in prison for the rape and murder of his girlfriend <gasps> and his girlfriend's mother. So listening to the Holy Spirit can save you time. It can save you heartache and it can save your life. Amen. So well said. I love that. You know, I want to touch a little bit on this big question, you know, that Christians have. <laughs> okay. You know, a lot of single Christians, they're not sure like whether they should date or they should just wait on the Lord or, you know, whether, you know, they should seek options. Like, what do you say to them, to those people that are not sure of whether they should date or not? Well, 
the word date is not in, in the Bible, okay? We see customs, we see traditions. What is in the Bible about your question is that, yes, the, those that wait upon the Lord, they shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. So always wait upon the Lord, definitely. Now, if we approach dating from a biblical perspective, then by all means, I think Christians should get out there and date because how are we gonna get a chance to know someone? Mm. Proverbs 24.3, the Bible often references a house in relation to marriage and family. Proverbs 24, 3 says, By wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. That word established means to make firm, to make secure. So we have wisdom and understanding. And you're like, Nadia, what does this have to do with my date on Friday night? So let me break it down. Wisdom is gathering the knowledge, the information, and the facts when you're dating someone. We're women, we're nosy, right? So that should be easy to really investigate someone. because The dating... number one investigator is our woman, right? <laughs> okay, yes. Um, dating is really mutual investigation and then understanding. And in this case, understanding is what you do with the facts, the knowledge, the data, the information. So if we can date with that perspective in mind and not ignore red flags and seek deal breakers, then absolutely Christians should date and get out there and get to know one another. Right, but it doesn't mean like, oh, I'm just all ears, all open to whatever. But also I feel like, you know, people, there's some people out there that they just wait and they continue to wait and they wait and they just expect God to just drop someone on their couch or something. Donna, let me tell you, if, if you are sitting at home with the prayer cloth and you are expecting no shade, but if you're expecting your husband to walk through the door, that's just not practical. It's just not practical. I agree. I agree. We have to put action to our faith. And that's something that I was talking about in the previous clip where I said, faith without works is dead. I mean, we got to put our faith into action in order to see God move in your circumstances and in your life. And, you know, I want to talk about a little bit, you know, Beyonce came out with this really great song called, if you like it, put a ring on it put a ring on it, you know? What, what do you say to those girls that are just waiting for their long-term boyfriend to propose? Or, you know, maybe they they just feel stuck. They feel like, man, this guy, he's just not proposing. And maybe they feel a little sad inside that he's just not doing that. What, what would you say to them? Because you waited a while before you got married, right? I waited two years and it does take time to get to know someone. It takes seasons, but it does not take like five or 10 years to, <laughs> for a guy to figure out if he wants to marry you or not. It does mm -hmm. not. And so I would say, don't settle. Don't waste your time. You only get one life, okay? So don't settle for less than God's best. It does not take five years for a man to decide whether or not he wants to marry you. So I think that they should, you know, I, I think they need a little nudge and get out there. With, in a loving way, right? In a loving way. We don't way. want to be crazy or. <laughs> no, no, no shade. But I feel like it, it's, it's wasting their time. It's wasting the best years of their life. Mm. And they should be in a relationship with someone who knows what they want and sees the value that Christ has placed in them. Amen. So how did you know that your husband was your husband, like before he was your husband? <laughs> My husband, before we got married, he, he just shows me the unimaginable love that God has for us. I get Aww, emotional. Oh, you get a choked up. Yeah, so he's, a good, he's a good man. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that's how I knew he had characteristics of God. Mm. He is so selfless. And I knew that that he was the one for me. So. And did you have to wait long to um, find him or for to, him to find you? Because uh, the word of God says that he who finds a wife obtains favor from the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Not the other way around, lady. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Not too long. I mean, I was 23 when we met, so I didn't have to wait too long mm -hmm. at all. So what has marriage taught you being married? How, how long have you been married now? I've been married, it'll be nine years in September. Wow, long time. praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've learned that um, I, I've seen a glimpse of the unimaginable love that God has for us. Mm -hmm. Because I used to be so insecure. I used to think like, who is gonna love me, you know, with my morning face, with my morning <laughs> breath, you know? I did not wake up like this. <laughs> and with all of our idiosyncrasies, I was like, who's gonna love me? But my husband sees me and loves me so differently. Mm -hmm. I've learned that true love, like the very nature of love is that it remains immune from shifting circumstances or emotions. It is resolute and steadfast, and it truly does 
endure all things. What is the biggest lesson that you've learned just in being married for nine years? It's not about me. Mm -hmm. It's about what I can give. Amen. Isn't marriage all about just sacrificing for that other person? I mean, every single day, I feel like you have to die to yourself and own your husband or your wife and just be there for them whenever they need you and just die to yourself continually, just like Jesus died for us, you know? And I love using the hashtag marriage is sacred because it is sacred. It's a covenant yes. relationship with your spouse and, you know, you could use that hashtag too if you're watching and you want to use it, you know, post a picture of you and your husband or your wife and just say marriage is sacred. Let's let's start a movement that's really going to change the course of society and and let's believe for these marriages, you know, because we need to change that divorce rate. Don't you agree? I completely agree. I completely agree. And now you have children. Tell us about your kids. Um my son is amazing uh, a blessing like it, it's like life just keeps getting better you know on this path of marriage and family mm. and he's just been such a blessing and I thought I knew love when I married my husband but this is like Donna I will scorch <laughs> the earth for my son <laughs> and my husband like Amen. Scorch the, earth. So the love of a, of a mother is just the most beautiful thing absolutely so you're you're a speaker when you go out and speak Tell us, tell my, my audience what exactly you focus on besides dating and... You know, a lot of times um, secular organizations will ask me to speak and they know I'm a believer. And so they'll <laughs> say, you know, um, don't try not to talk too much about God, you know, try not to, but it's like that. It's like asking me to talk about peanut butter without mentioning George Washington Carver <laughs> or jelly, right? <laughs> right, right, right. So I definitely um, talk about focus on relationships. I focus on um, past dysfunction and how that affects our marriages and our, our current relationships. And I always, you know, throw some Christ in there because you cannot leave him out. So Amen. I always um, end it and summarize it with have faith in Christ and I, love God with all your heart. I love that. And I see, you know, I see marriage as like a triangle and it's, you know, God is on top and then your spouse and then you. It's like, it's like a triangle, you know, but what are the keys to a successful marriage, would you say? I would say the key, a successful marriage starts long before you ever get married. So choose wisely. Use wisdom in your choice of who you marry. After that, the recipe is simple. It's Christ, companionship, intimacy, and covenant. Christ, having a Christ-centered marriage is, is number one. Matthew 7 says that a man built his house on the rock. Again, we have this house reference. Mm -hmm. And the rain fell, the torrents blew and beat against the house, yet it still stood firm. So I would implore people to build your house on the rock that is Christ Jesus so that when troubles come, and adversity is going to come to every marriage, but that your marriage can stand firm in Christ. Secondly, companionship, laughter. Song of Solomon says that we are to have um, where to find our best friend in marriage, right? Yes. And then intimacy, not just physical intimacy, yes. there's spiritual, emotional, experiential, um, and intellectual as well. So marriage is to be a lifelong intimate relationship. And finally, having a covenant view of marriage as opposed to a com consumer view, mm -hmm. which is like when I'm going out looking for a spouse, it's like I'm buying myself a Christmas present. What can you do for me? If I don't like you, I'm gonna exchange you, I'm gonna return you, or when I get, tired, when I get tired of playing with you, you know, I'm just gonna throw you out. Mm. No, we need to have a covenant view of marriage, which exactly. is practicing and reciprocating sacrificial agape love on a daily basis. If you, if you gain weight, that's okay because I'm committed. If you lose your job, that's okay because I'm committed. If you get on my nerves, I might need a minute to pray for you, but it's okay because I'm committed. Amen. That's right. I want you to look into that camera for me, Nadia. Okay. And maybe there's a man or a woman watching, and they long to be married, and they're not married yet. They're waiting on the Lord for their spouse. Will you just encourage them right now? I want to encourage you that, because this was hard for me to get, God loves you. I know people say it all the time, but God loves you intimately and personally. 
not only does he love you, you might be feeling lonely, feelings of despair. God cares about your feelings, for we do not serve a high priest who is untouched by the weakness, by the feelings of our weakness. So he does care about your feelings. In fact, Psalm says that even our tears are collected and accounted for. So I just want to encourage you to not settle. Do not settle for less than God's best. Amen. Have faith in his plan. Have hope in his timing. And what remains is love. Keep your heart open for the love that Christ is preparing for you. Because if you be in Christ, you really are already taking part in the greatest love story ever told, okay? <laughs> Amen, I love that. Now, if someone watching would like to get a hold of you, maybe they wanna ask you to come speak at their church or something, where can they go? Um, you can go to Nadia H Motivates. That's <laughs> www.nadiahmotivates.com. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you on Face of Slavery. You're such a blessing. Thank you so much. Get that book, ladies and gentlemen. You won't regret it because if you're dating or if you're single, you need some advice and she's going to give it to you. <laughs> and thank you so much for watching Faith with Flavor. I am so blessed that you joined me today for this show. And I want to encourage you. You know, I never want to leave you without a word of encouragement because the word of God is full of promises that we can take for ourselves and just believe. In Song of Solomon 8.4, it says, Oh, let me warn you, sisters in Jerusalem, don't excite love. Don't stir it up until the time is ripe and you're ready. So let that be a reminder for you. Don't stir it up. Don't allow love that shouldn't be in your life be there. Let God fulfill you. Let God come into those inner parts of your being so that when the time is ripe and you're ready, you can be fully complete in Christ first and then with your mate. God bless you. Thanks for watching Faith with Flavor.